In my last lecture, I talked about the 18th century, or at least the 18th century up to 1789, as the great age of the aristocracy. So one of the delights of being an aristocratic young man, especially an aristocratic young Englishman, was taking an extended grand tour of Europe, especially Italy. And as these young Englishmen flooded into Italy, they, like all tourists, hunted for souvenirs to bring home. So Canaletto's Vedute, or paintings of Venice, uh, suited their tastes on many levels. By the way, Vedute means view. Uh, his carefully rendered skies, uh, perspectively accurate buildings, vibrant light, all appealed uh, both to the taste for the classical and to the trend toward naturalism. Uh, ancient ruins, likewise, became a favorite subject of artists. We're going to encounter Piranesi again when we get to Romanticism and see some of his more hallucinogenic works. Uh, but here is a more straightforward rendering of the Arch of Titus. There was serious money to be made with this kind of print. Uh, in the middle of the mid to late 1700s, more or less amateur archaeologists began serious excavations of the ruins of Pompeii and Herculaneum, and this basically became all the rage. Uh, this isn't an especially famous painting, uh, but it does show excavations at around this time and shows the fascination with those excavations. Uh, so this is a modern photo, but it gives you a sense of why visitors found and still find these ruins so compelling. Uh, so do you remember Pompeian wall paintings, which is a favorite topic for the college board? Uh, here's another example. Well, these were an incredible revelation when they were discovered, uh, and they promptly inspired imitation, particularly in the interior decoration of English country homes. And for some reason, the College Board loves to ask about this, I now know. So here is a Pompeii-inspired interior, and here's another one. And you recognize the similarity to the sort of highly geometric styles that you've just seen. Um, British pottery entrepreneur Josiah Wedgwood sold thousands of classically inspired pottery pieces, you know, plates, figurines, uh, jewelry, uh, made a fortune on it. Again, this is the taste of the time. Uh, and here you see a famous neoclassical country home in Britain. So what architect were these architects channeling? Well, I trust you all guessed Palladio. Uh, so here you see the floor plan of the Villa Rotunda and the floor plan of Chiswick in England. It's not quite as oriented toward the outside. Uh, if you've ever spent any time in England, particularly in, say, November, you'll understand why. It is not. It's a damp climate. Uh, but again, you see some real similarities. Uh, by the way, the taste for the natural and the neoclassical revival came together in this and other classical uh, Egyptian, excuse me, English aristocratic gardens. I'm not reading my own notes very well. So you notice the little classical ruin and the obelisk there, then the formal gardens, and then up uh, on the upper right, the more naturalistic gardens, which reflected the evolving taste. And we've seen that in the landscapes, for example, of Gainsborough. Uh, here you see the most famous Palladio-inspired American building, Monticello, which was designed by its owner, Thomas Jefferson. So he's not just the owner, but the architect. And it, too, was modeled on the Villa Rotunda and, to some extent, Chiswick House. You see all of that there. That, by the way, is another question that the College Board loves to ask. Uh, and here, and boy, are we speeding through neoclassicism, uh, here are two neoclassical French churches. Uh, the Pantheon, you recognize the dome, pretty obvious its origins, but also the temple facade. Uh, and then the Madeline, which is on the bottom, uh, was actually not constructed as a church. It was constructed as a temple of glory by Napoleon, allegedly for the glory of the French soldiers. But I think that really pretty much translated him for the glory of Napoleon. Uh, it is now a church. So neoclassical painting echoed this fascination with the ancient world and also represented a return to the emphasis on line. So basically, Poussin starts beating out Rubens again. But what really is significant about neoclassical art, and probably what you most need to understand about it, is its political content. This is the art of the Age of Revolution, or I should say it's the art of the early Age of Revolution. When we get to Romanticism, we're going to see the art of the revolution devouring its own children. 
So I mentioned the revulsion against Rococo art and aristocratic excess. Uh, and we looked in my last lecture at the moralistic genre paintings of Gros and Chardin, you know, ordinary people, the village bride, the mother and her children praying before a meal. As the 18th century progressed, a new generation of painters increasingly used scenes from classical history, not so much mythology as history, in particular to bolster their call for civic virtue. So in this painting, which is by one of the century's leading women painters, and notice there are several prominent women painters in this era. Uh, so we see the mother of a group of sons who would grow up to lead a democratic revolt against Rome's aristocrats, the Gracchi brothers. Uh, the painting captures a famous encounter and this would have been a very familiar story to the classically educated aristocracy and upper middle class. So the woman in the center is Cornelia. She's the wife of a Roman patrician, and she's walking down the street with her children. And the scene, it's a narrative painting. In fact, it would be a very good example to use for narrative painting. Uh, so she comes across a woman who's holding a jewelry box. And the woman with the jewelry box, box asks Cornelia, well, where are all your jewels? If your husband is so successful, where's your bling? Cornelia responded to the woman by gesturing to her children. They were her jewels. She then told the woman, uh, the woman with the jewelry box, that it was her job and her responsibility to raise her boys to be great men like their father. So she had her mind on higher things than glittery jewels. So here you have just the opposite of the always bejeweled and adulterous French aristocratic women who ran Parisian salons and did not, for the most part, pay much attention to their kids. And this emphasis on self-sacrifice and civic virtue pervades neoclassical painting. I'm going to make a confession. I actually often find these paintings a little stiff and heavy-handed. They are so clearly propagandistic uh, that they kind of get on my nerves. Now, Rococo gets on my nerves in a different way, uh, too pink, too frothy. Uh, soon we'll be in Romanticism, and I'll stop making snide comments because I love the art of Romanticism. Uh, but meanwhile, I want to digress a moment. This painting isn't in your book, but it's part of a painting of intellectual women. Uh, it's actually the painter is Richard Samuel, who showed these women as muses in the Temple of Apollo. So it's very much a neoclassical work. But the women in this painting, and you're just seeing a portion of it, uh, are all actually fairly famous women intellectuals. And the woman at the easel painting is, in fact, Angelica Kaufman, which is why I included it here. Uh, they met together frequently to discuss literature, art, and politics, and they referred to themselves as the Blue Stocking Society. And Blue Stocking became a term actually used well into the 19th century for smart, uppity females. Uh, what the origin of that term is is actually uncertain. One theory is that it referred to wearing knitted as opposed to silk stockings. So in other words, the stockings of ordinary life and not the stockings you wear to the opera. Um, if that's the case, it's actually rather misleading. These women, as you can probably tell from their costuming, uh, are were all upper middle class or aristocratic. Uh, and they were by no means universally popular. Uh, here is a less flattering caricature by Thomas Rowlandson, who is one of the famous characterists of this era. You're, you know, you've seen Hogarth, but he's showing the men in a so-called, the women in a so-called cat fight. Not everybody liked intellectual women. But back to neoclassicism. The patriotic emphasis on public virtue also showed up in the sculpture of Jean-Antoine Houdon. He is not in your book, but he does show up in the AP exam. I'm guessing he was in an earlier version. And actually, I don't know why he's not in your book, uh, because he was a leading neoclassical sculptor. And again, following through with the political theme, he sculpted leading figures of the Enlightenment and of the revolutions, including George Washington, whom he did not uh, sculpt in person, Benjamin Franklin, whom he did and in the middle of Voltaire, one of the leading, perhaps the most famous of the philosophes. Ah, and here we have what is probably the most famous neoclassical painting, one that's very likely to appear on your AP exam, uh, David's Oath of the Horatii. I, I may be pronouncing that wrong. Uh, they are three brothers who have vowed to settle a dispute between their city, Rome, and a rival city by engaging in combat with three citizens of that rival city. So note the manly, determined brothers, almost as a phalanx. I mean, they are completely united. Uh, and the contrast with their weepy, disunited kind of scatters. This is you have the, you know, the almost military precision of the man and the drooping females. 
Uh, one unpleasant aspect of the revolt against Rococo and its feminine domination and an unpleasant aspect, I would say, of Rousseau's philosophy uh, was that it condemned most female pursuits that took place outside the home. Uh, women were thought to be focused on home and hearth and therefore not sufficiently public-spirited except to the extent uh, that they were raising sons to be public-spirited uh, servants of the state. It can get a little creepy and it's also a little ironic given the role that women would play in the revolution. Uh, now you're going to watch the first of a series of short video clips about this, uh, this artist, actually, and this one is specifically about this painting. By the way, the narrator, Simon Shama, you've seen before. Uh, he has this Power of Art series on BBC, and we uh, watched him discussing Caravaggio uh, and Rembrandt. Or I'm not, Actually, you may, I may not have shown you any of the Rembrandt video. It's very good. Uh, he is actually a famous historian of the French Revolution, much more famous than he is as an art historian, which is really kind of a hobby of his. Uh, he wrote what I think is the best book available in English on the French Revolution. It's very long, but it's very good, entitled Citizens. Uh, and this whole video uh, is really an excellent and I think dramatically presented overview of the French, the build up to the French Revolution, the revolution, how it uh, decays into violence, and then finally the rise of Napoleon. Uh, my saying all that is probably not enough to sell. In fact, it may make you want to run and hide, but I tried, right? So here's another famous scene of civic virtue and sacrifice. This one's not in your book, but I could really imagine it showing up on the exam. Uh, we see Socrates condemned to death by the people of Athens for allegedly teaching the young people not to respect the city and its gods. But in fact, he, Socrates is viewed as a uh, seeker after wisdom and a virtue. Uh, so this is not a painting encouraging rebellion against at least good government. So note the seated figure on the far left. That's Plato. Uh, really, I think the most moving figure in the painting as a picture of inconsolable grief. Uh, and note the neoclassical elements. So you see the emphasis on line, the use of, ar of architectural uh, framing, the strong and dramatic gestures, I'd think almost sometimes too dramatic, a little over the top. But remember that this, like Baroque art, is to some extent the art of theater, and politics was very theatrical at this time. And finally, you see color used really more as an accent than as a defining feature of the work. So David actually rose to a very high position in the revolutionary government. He became Robespierre's official head of propaganda. And by the way, he was an enthusiastic proponent of chopping heads off. Uh, he was actually a pretty bloodthirsty revolutionary. Uh, here is, and by the way, when Robespierre fell, so did David. But here is David's most famous propaganda work, The Death of Murad. Uh, and let's hear about this work from our favorite uh, art historian, Sister Wendy. Uh, let me just note first, though, that we will pick up the French Revolution and the strange career of Jacques-Louis David, by the way, in our next lecture. Uh, just to give you greatest hits, he's uh, going to turn to the dark side of the forest and side with Napoleon. Uh, my last slide, which I'm not going to discuss, but which I'm including, is a summary of neoclassical art. Oops, I guess I repeated that 